is there a big, uh, is there a reasonable chunk? Yeah. <laughs> well, it's wonderful to be back at uh, TASI. Uh, I've told this story at every TASI that I've, that I've been at, but uh, I'm, uh, there's always a small sting when I come a lecturer at TASI because I was rejected from TASI when I was an, an, uh, a grad student. Uh, Brian Green. Uh, by, by Brian Green. Yes. Fuck you, Brian. <laughs> you know, I never knew all this time. What an asshole. What an asshole. <laughs> now I feel better, you know. <laughs> anyway. Um, but uh, no, all, all kidding aside, it's uh, uh, even though even though I cry myself to bed every night when I think about it, it's wonderful to be back. Um, so uh, Ian asked me to talk about uh, the future of particle physics, which I have no idea what this uh, um, no idea exactly what he had in mind. <laughs> um, but let me make a few general remarks, and then I'll tell you what the uh, what the plan for the for the lectures is uh, going to be. Um, the most uh, uh, I guess the most, the most zeroth order remark to make which is that um, I think this is one of the most uh, amazingly interesting periods of time to be thinking about uh, fundamental physics as a theoretical physicist. I've said it many times in, in, in many contexts. I mean, if I could choose when to be born and start grad school, uh, I would really, uh, I think the ideal time to, uh, to do it would be right around now. Um, so I really envy you guys because uh, you're in a position to be able to do what I would dearly like to be able to do, which is to have a, an extra 20 years uh, tacked on to uh, be able to uh, think about these things. Now, uh, w when I say that, this is sometimes, um, uh, uh, and I often get the, uh, the question, there's, there's some cognitive dissonance, it seems, between this idea this is one of the most exciting periods to be thinking about fundamental physics, and um, what you sometimes hear from some other people, uh, often older people, which is that it's a slow time and it's sort of depressing and, you know, we don't know what's going to happen with the LHC. Oh my God, the nightmare scenario. We're not going to see anything other than, than, than the Higgs or we may or may not see dark matter in the next uh, three or four years. Oh my God, it's so terrible. It was so much nicer 40 years ago with this flood of experiments and all this stuff going on. So how can both these things be true at the same time? One of us is lying, right? <laughs> one of this, these groups of people is, uh, well, in fact, none of us are, 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 are lying. It's, um, uh, it's really like this. Uh, I, I find that uh, a, lot of, a lot of what uh, uh, goes for the, uh, uh, the, the goes for a certain kind of nostalgia, especially in particle physics, holds up the amazing period of the 1960s and 70s of the development of the standard model of particle physics as the model for what a golden period in physics should be like. And there's no doubt about it, it was an amazing period. We learned a huge amount about the way the world works. There was a almost weekly or monthly back and forth between theory and experiment, and from that point of view, it was very, very exciting. On the other hand, on the time scale of 200 years, <laughs> Uh, the period of the 60s and 70s is not going to be seen as uh, by far the most important part of what happened in the 20th century. The big deal of the 20th century were the huge revolutions of relativity and quantum mechanics in the earlier part, the beginning of the century. Those were really paradigm changing things. Those were things that exploded the uh, centuries old uh, Newtonian framework and replaced it by something else. And the period leading up to that did not look like daily back and forth between theories and experiments and the definition of excitement being a plot that looked like that. <laughs> okay? In fact, uh, in fact, in a sense, the most important experimental discovery from over 100 years ago was the null results of the Michelson-Morley experiment. Okay? And what were these guys doing? They were looking to uh, measure an ether drift uh, to an accuracy of order v squared over c squared where experiments had already measured it to an actuary of v over c. It's a little bit like the naturalness problem of uh, 120 years ago. They expected to see a drift of order v over c. It wasn't. Ah, oh, now you can make excuses. Twin ether, you know. Uh, 
right? <laughs> you're not going to see something at order of v over c. Maybe it's going to be order of v squared over c squared. Then you look at order of v squared over c squared. You know, it's not seeing something. Uh, that was the paradigm shifting thing back then. Okay. Uh, and indeed, many things changed. Many things changed radically. The time scale for the developments, even taking into account, you know, especially you think you're in the uh, 1800s, the time scale between Maxwell predicting his electromagnetic waves and them being discovered was 25 years. <laughs> okay? uh, this is even in the middle of the Industrial Revolution, all these things, uh, amazing things happening. This idea that uh, theory and experiment uh, go in lockstep on the monthly time scale is not a typical thing in the development of fundamental physics. Our field has actually, for centuries, been driven by eternal questions, questions where, where progress, big progress, is measured on the time scale of decades and centuries, both from the experimental and the theoretical point of view. And in fact, the really big transformative uh, things that happened in, in the last century were very much along those lines. So. Uh, so when I now say that, uh, in my view, and I think in the view of many people, we're at one of the most exciting junctures in the, in the, in the, uh, in the history of uh, uh, fundamental physics, it's because we have, we have plowed through a whole bunch of other very important but more mundane problems, um, on the grand scheme of things, more mundane problems, in order to finally arrive at having the next questions that we're asking in this field be really, truly ancient, deep, huge ones. Okay? In fact, the most dramatic things that are on the table in the 21st century uh, are really, broadly speaking, two big sets of questions. One of them is that we got these revolutions of uh, space-time and quantum mechanics in the early part of the 20th century, and yet we have lots of indications that certainly the notion of space-time is suspect and has to be replaced by something else. It's possible that we, have, we might, in order to deal with very subtle questions of, about of, uh, applying quantum mechanics uh, to the entire universe, uh, we might even have to extend our understanding of what quantum mechanics is. No, I'm not saying modify. I'm saying extend our understanding of what quantum mechanics is in order to allow us to make sense of various cosmological situations where standard quantum mechanics is impotent and doesn't tell us what, what to do. So these two big foundations on which the 20th century are based are now in question. And there's a second set of questions, potentially related to the first, which are uh, more down to earth. They are more related to things that we can probe with experiments, which are the attempt to answer the very simple question, why is there a macroscopic universe? Okay. Why is it in a world with violent quantum mechanical fluctuations, more and more violent at shorter and shorter distances, uh, why is it we nonetheless have macroscopic long range order? And this is just a reformulation of the famous fine-tuning problems. The cosmological constant problem and the hierarchy problem are just that question. Why is it that we have a macroscopic world uh, even when we have very violent quantum fluctuations on short distances? Um, as I said, it's not even completely implausible that these questions are connected to each other. After all, uh, if, we, if we didn't fine-tune for the cosmological constant, we wouldn't have a big universe. The universe would be curled up near the Planck scale, so we wouldn't have a space-time there to speak of, to begin with. So the questions of what, sp how space-time emerges from more primitive building blocks may well be tied up with the fine-tuning problems. For example, the, uh, the uh, CC problem uh, in that case. OK, so, so, so that's the level of drama of the questions that we, are, uh, that we are now confronted with. Now, people could have asked analogs of these questions 30 years ago, 50 years ago, 100 years ago, 400 years ago. <laughs> And at every one of those times, it would have been the wrong time to ask this question. Okay? And that's uh, you know, the number one rule of progress in science is you have to remember what the really big questions are, but you have to work on the next question. You can't uh, just dream randomly uh, and not concretely about what, the next, uh, about what the next frontier is. So it would have made no sense to wonder about the origin of the universe 400 years ago when we didn't know how planets worked, or 120 years ago when we didn't know simple things like why grass is green and water is wet. <laughs> okay? We understand the answer to all those questions now. Okay? And in fact, through the development of the standard model, uh, we have now come to a point, the, 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 uh, the standard model as a particular example of an effective field theory within the effective field theory paradigm, we understand more exquisitely than we've ever understood before what we know, what we don't know. Okay? And, um, and so 
we've gone through all of the questions of the mechanics of how things work, the mechanics of how particles interact. And the questions that are before us are now these one level higher, deeper questions, the questions that people did and could have asked centuries ago, but was the wrong time to ask. Now, whether we like it or not, these are the next questions that we have to answer. Okay? So uh, an analogy, which, which I like, is it's like uh, you want to climb Mount Everest. And the first thing you know is that out there somewhere are these mountain ranges called the Himalayas with really tall mountains there. Okay? So the first thing you got to do is get, get there. You got to go through all the foothills, got to get all the Sherpas, you got to get the, you know, month or three months or however long it is with donkeys and all this stuff to like get up to base camp, right? Finally, you're at base camp. It was a huge amount of work to get to base camp, okay? Once you're in base camp, it's different, okay? Once you're in base camp, you see the, the thing that you're trying to climb. Uh, and the strategies are different. How you think about it is different. Uh, you start doing anything you can. You start taking a few paths up. You do this, you do that. Uh, eventually, maybe someone, someone gets there. That's where we are today, I think. I think these, uh, these, these, these ancient questions, uh, slightly more concretely uh, encapsulated in the, in, the, uh, uh, in, the, in the issues of what the more primitive building blocks are that space, time, and quantum mechanics potentially emerge from, and why there's a macroscopic universe, are our Everest. Okay? And we've gotten to base camp. We understand enough to be able to say that that's the next set of questions. And that's what we have to work on. So that's how this cognitive dissonance between people like me saying this is the most exciting period to be doing fundamental physics and I wish I was you guys now versus people saying, oh no, I wish I was alive in the 60s and I, and, and I participated in the development of the standard model would have been spectacular. It has to do with a different level of ambition for what you want to do with your life. Okay? If you want to uh, take the principles that you were given uh, by your revolutionary ancestors and you know build the correct description of the literally the phenomenon you see then the 60s were the time for you uh, if you're excited by the fact that you have to bring about a revolution on the same scale as that what people had to do in going from classical physics to quantum mechanics then this is the time for you uh, now there's no there's no no one promises you a rose garden we don't know how long this is going to take we don't know how long it is going it, to it's, it's risky this business is fundamentally risky. If anyone told you this is a safe thing to do with your life, they're crazy. This is a crazy thing to do with your life. <laughs> and I tell every grad student who comes by who's interested in working, you can ask Cliff Chung, I believe I told him this, uh, um, uh, that if there's anything else you'd be happy to do with your life, do that instead. <laughs> okay? um, but if, you're, if this is the only thing that will make you happy with, 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 with your life, you should know it's risky. Um, we don't know the time scale on which great theoretical progress will be made. We don't know the kind of experimental information we're going to get and the time scale on which we're going to get the experimental information. So why do we do it? Well, we do it because there's nothing else that we could imagine doing. And but someone's got to do it. Okay? So it's possible that we'll live through the era where huge progress on these questions will be made. I think it's not implausible that we'll live through such an era. We're certainly not going to get the answer to all the questions, even the beginning of the answer to all the questions. But, uh, but I think it's uh, so exciting to be in this sort of first generation of people who are, uh, who's grappling with the next level, uh, uh, the next level set of questions uh, compared to the pure mechanics of understanding how uh, uh, elementary particle interactions work that, uh, that uh, I think that substantiates the statement that uh, this is the most exciting period uh, I could imagine being in. All right. So, um, so, so much for the general rah-rah intro. <laughs> Um, now, just for the plan for, the, for this lecture and some of the uh, uh, subsequent lectures. So, um, in keeping with the uh, themes uh, that I've talked about, I'm going to organize them in, um, uh, in somewhat chronological order of, um, uh, of what future might mean. Okay? So, so today, uh, I want to talk about, um, really I want to talk about the uh, fine-tuning problems. and new physics at, at colliders at the LHC. Um, so uh, this is, has to do with the various issues to do with uh, why there's a macroscopic universe. Um, tomorrow, 
I will talk about longer term future, the future of collider physics. And here I'll talk about two aspects of uh, uh, collider physics. Uh, first, a little briefly, um, on the Earth, I will talk about some motivations and prospects for 100 TeV colliders. And I'll also talk about colliders in the sky, what you could call cosmological collider physics. And how we could look for, directly look in the sky uh, in uh, non Gaussianities in the CMB as well as uh, in more properly in large scale structure, look for signatures of uh, heavy particles that could have uh, interacted with the, with the infoton, particles perhaps as heavy as uh, 10 to the 14 GeV, well, well above what we can see uh, uh, in uh, particle accelerators on Earth. And in talking about this, we'll also talk about a little bit of. Uh, uh, standard, although not taught in courses so much anymore, um, uh, bits of uh, particle physics and collider physics that'll be useful uh, later. Okay, so so this is really, I mean, I'll I'll, I'll be talking about uh, 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 about the underlying theoretical issues as well, but this is really uh, targeted at near-term uh, collider physics. Longer term collider physics, this is on the time scale perhaps of 30 years, 20, 30 years, uh, to a talk about uh, 100 TV colliders. And uh, the next 30 years of uh, experiments in cosmology are really about trying to measure the non Gaussianities in the CMB and in large scale structure. And this part will be telling you how to in interpret that information and look in that pattern of non Gaussianities for the presence of, uh, of heavy particles, um, just like we do at colliders. So these two are mostly driven by experimental questions. Um, and in the third and fourth lectures, and we'll see how we do for a time, in the third lecture, uh, I want to turn to more theoretical issues and talk about the challenge of UV completion. So um, uh, how we go about thinking about how to UV complete theories with you know, dimensionful couplings where amplitudes grow as we go to very high energies. And I just want to tell you, at least if we have weakly coupled theories, what the rules are for UV completion. Okay? Uh, when we understand what the rules are, we will uh, very quickly see the answer to a nice question. Uh, something. That something that might have struck you is that it's a little funny that there are theories like the weak interactions that we ran into, roughly speaking, in the 20th century, and then we understood in the 20th century. But there are much older theories like gravity, phenomena, not theories like gravity, which we've known about for even theoretically for hundreds of years and we're still mysterious in the ultraviolet. So why is it that the most ancient things are still mysterious when we try to extrapolate to the UV, but these fancier things that we discovered in the 20th century, we also basically understood within 60 years. Okay. Well, what I'm going to talk about here is a, is a sort of a unified framework uh, in which to think about the challenge of UV completion. And I, I, I mention this question because uh, uh, this is something which is um, uh, I think going to be theoretically interesting, not on the 30-year time scale, even the 10-year time scale, just in the next few years. Uh, I suspect more and more progress is going to be made uh, along these lines. So I just want to tell you a little bit about it. Uh, another slogan for this is trying to derive string theory from the bottom up as the unique. Uh, Conjecturally, and I'll tell you why to conjecture and it'll turn into a sharp mathematical uh, statement uh, um, for what the possible weakly coupled UV completions of, of theories like gravity can uh, look like. Okay, and finally, and uh, I don't know if we'll get there for time, but if I do have time, um, I will talk about what is probably more, most futuristic of all, but which we're seeing. Uh, uh, a number of indications 
from many points of view, which is uh, the idea that not only we understand on general grounds that, 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 that space-time should be an emergent phenomenon, but that it's not just space-time, but that it's uh, space-time and quantum mechanics, both, that have to emerge hand-in-hand hand from some more uh, primitive building blocks. Okay. And uh, now, this entire series of lectures is driven by data. Some of the data is obvious. Okay? Some of it, we're thinking about the LHC, or we're thinking about what we might see in 20 or 30 years in, uh, uh, in the sky or 100 TV colliders. But what I, what I want to emphasize is that this sort of uh, often uh, rough split that people imagine between more phenomenological and more formal parts of the field is actually kind of nonsense. Um, there is one unified subject big subject of, uh, of theoretical physics. The whole point is that we have universal laws that are applicable everywhere. So if you know them, you can do anything. <laughs> okay. um, but also that some of the questions that we have uh, in trying to, and that's why I've chosen these, these, these two topics to focus on uh, especially, um, to highlight the tremendous constraints that we have already, not, not from uh, agreeing with experiments that haven't been done yet, but from agreeing with all the old experiments that have been done for the past 100 years. Okay? We learned in the last 100 years about relativity and quantum mechanics. And as you'll see from parts 3 and 4, it is tremendously non-trivial, tremendously non-trivial to, uh, to come up with new ideas, sometimes to change the theory, because you're trying to complete it. Okay? You're trying to complete it in, in the UV. Uh, and sometimes to try to understand where it comes from, from a different starting point. Okay? But trying to be compatible with the principles of space-time and quantum mechanics, or locality and unitarity, are tremendously, tremendously constraining shackles on your imagination. You can't roll out of bed in the morning and do anything you want. Okay? And so you care a lot about data, just not new experiments. All the old experiments are good enough uh, to, to put a huge obstacle uh, to just even trying to begin to make, to make progress. Okay? So, and that's what I hope you'll see from the, uh, from the more theoretical parts here, is that these are also completely uh, highly constrained by physics. They're highly constrained by, by the most basic zeroth order facts about the world that, uh, that we have both relativity and quantum mechanics. All right, so, uh, so any questions after the sermon? No? All right, great. It's exhausting giving these sermons. So, so <laughs> all right, very good. So, um, so since we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about these fancy things about the end of space-time um, in, uh, in the more theoretical lectures, uh, let me get going immediately with uh, part one and uh, remind you. Is there a question? Sorry. And uh, uh, remind you about what the fine-tuning problems are. And while there's many ways of talking about the uh, fine-tuning puzzles, presumably you've had lectures already on the hierarchy problem. Uh, um, uh, I want to talk about it in, in perhaps a slightly different language. Um, uh, that'll, be, uh, that'll be useful to us later. Uh, Actually, two languages. Let's do one of them quickly, because you're probably quite familiar with uh, this one. You're probably familiar with both of them. But the first thing we're going to do is imagine the universe is in a big box. right? And all we want to do is look at the energy in that box, the energy in all of the harmonic oscillators for all the particle in the box modes in that box. Okay? So we have this mode. We have that mode. Okay? We have lots and lots of different particle in a box mode. So what is the energy in the box? The energy is the sum over all the modes, which are labeled by some nx and y and nz, let's say, right, of a half h bar, and I'll put the h bar here uncharacteristically, root times, uh, well, it's a half h, bar, half h bar omega, right? So the omega for every mode, if the box has side length capital L, if it's a cube, the omega is root nx squared plus ny squared plus nz squared over l squared plus m squared. 
if it's a boson, and you have got to remember a little that if it's a fermion, there's a minus sign. So an x squared plus n y squared plus n z squared over l squared plus m fermion squared, right? This is just the k squared. The k is quantized in each direction, right? In units of uh, 1 over l. OK, so that's what the energy is. Well, there's a standard familiar way of approximating the sum by an integral when l is large. You pull out an overall l cubed, and then it's an integral over the k's d cubed k, and now let me put h bar to 1, a uh, half root k squared plus m boson squared minus root k squared plus m fermion squared. OK? So the energy per unit volume in the box is the integral d cubed k a half root k squared plus m boson squared minus root k squared plus m fermion squared. And this estimate has in it the two famous fine-tuning problems that we're used to. The cosmological constant problem and the hierarchy problem are just expansions of this. Because if we, <coughs> we have to sum over the bosons and sum over the fermions here, So, so at very large k, uh, we can ignore these masses. And so this integral is quartically divergent, d cubed k times k. So we get something, roughly speaking, that goes like some k max to the fourth times maybe the total number of bosons minus total number of fermions. Of course, this is kind of BS, because it's assuming that we have the same cutoff for every boson and fermion species. We have no idea if the cutoffs are the same. But let me just uh, uh, write it that way. And then I have something like. The subleading piece is k max squared. Um, and then I have uh, uh, the sum of m boson squared minus the sum of m fermion squared, plus dot dot. OK, so this leading piece is the CC. Leading piece is a cosmological constant. The subleading piece, if we Remember that, that the mass of particles, like fermions and, and Ws, uh, that the mass of a fermion is some lambda times the expectation value of the Higgs. The mass of a boson is some g times the expectation value of the Higgs, and so on. Then this thing is of order k max squared times some lambda squared minus lambda squared plus g squared, Higgs squared. And so just looking at the energy, just the simple estimate of the energy uh, of all the zero modes in the box um, leads us to expect an enormous energy density in the vacuum and a huge mass for the Higgs. The dependence of that, of the particle species on the, uh, on the Higgs VAB uh, means that we have uh, a hierarchy problem. I, I do it like this. There's, uh, you're all familiar with these arguments, but I do it like this just to emphasize how closely connected, from this way of thinking about it, the CC problem and the hierarchy problem are. <laughs> okay, so there, one is the subleading, uh, uh, one is the subleading term uh, in the other from this from this point of view. All right. So now, the cosmological constant, famously, uh, its size. If we naively estimate the k-max at the Planck scale, we would curve the universe down to 10 to the minus 33 centimeters, which it is not. If we estimate it by putting k-max near the 100 of GeV or TeV scale, then what is the curvature of the universe you would get from that? Does anyone know off the top of your head? If you put, if you put uh, k-max, if the cosmological constant was order 100 GeV to the fourth, what is the radius of curvature of the universe? It's around a millimeter. Okay. Okay. Also not true. <laughs> so what size do you have to make the cosmological constant in order for it to be compatible with the curvature that we see? Never mind that it was, uh, we now, of course, know the universe is, is accelerating. And the simplest explanation is that there is a vacuum energy. How big does a vacuum energy have to be? Does uh, anybody know? Roughly how big does it have to be? Okay. <coughs> Sorry? Uh, it's 10 to the minus 3 electron volt to the fourth. Okay? So the size of the cosmological constant uh, has got to be comparable 
to 10 to the minus 3 EV to the fourth. Okay, so that's our first very, very big problem because it's uh, the estimate is nowhere, nowhere near that. And of course, we know uh, uh, that that if k max was an order via Planck scale, that that correction to the Higgs mass would be 32 orders of magnitude bigger than uh, than uh, than would be compatible with the uh, observed value of the weak scale. Okay, so. Uh, and, you know, typically when you do a simple estimate, you're a theoretical physicist, you should be able to estimate anything in the world and get it right to a factor of 10. If you're Fermi, to a factor of 2. <laughs> uh, you should not be off by 120 orders of magnitude. And when you are off by huge factors, like when people predicted an infinite amount of energy coming out of ovens, <laughs> okay, <laughs> Um, you pay attention, right? There's something wrong. You do a, we're not talking about, uh, we're not talking about, you know, some detailed disagreement between theory and experiment of the sixth decimal place of some calculation. You're trying to answer why is the universe big? Okay? And the answer is it shouldn't be big. It should be teeny, 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 tiny, curved uh, down near the Planck length, or maybe even a millimeter. But it shouldn't uh, be this big, big uh, macroscopic universe. Of course, as I'm sure has been emphasized to you a hundred times, these fine-tuning problems are not, they're not the same kind of problems as other questions that we've run into. They're not dynamical problems. They're problems about trying to understand the value of parameters. And uh, so they're not like the question, when you scatter longitudinal Ws, the amplitude grows strong at one and a half TeV. So something has got to give before that, okay? That's a f absolute physics problem, right? Something definitely goes wrong when you collide the particles without a Higgs or, or anything else. That problem absolutely demands an answer. Or the analogous to the problem, what happens near the Planck scale when you scatter gravitons? Same thing. The amplitudes grow large. Something has got to give. Something new has got to happen. Here it's not like that because absolutely nothing stops us from imagining that we just uh, cancel uh, we, we fine-tune, we cancel. You don't have to say the words fine-tuning. We just take those values from experiment. Every time you have power divergences, power divergences are completely absorbable into a change of what you mean by the local parameters. And you could just take the attitude, you're going to take it from experiment and be done with it. Okay? There's nothing wrong with that attitude. A naturalness, which is this idea that some physics has got to come in at the correct scale k max in order for these estimates not to be too big okay that's that's the argument you've heard many times this is not a principle of nature it's a it's a guide it's a guideline for the kind of new physics that you might do, uh, that that you might expect it's a guideline that's worked a number of times in the last 100 years uh, it has failed if we go further back in time if we go back 2000 years uh, uh, analogous arguments uh, uh, haven't worked um, but uh, but I don't want to spend any time on philosophy here, actually. Uh, what I want to say is something a little bit more sharp and concrete, that within the standard model, you're perfectly within your rights to say you don't care about the hierarchy problem. You're just going to take it from experiment. No problem. Now, if you do that, uh, you're also giving up explaining the value of the weak scale. Why did the symmetry break? Why was the sign negative? You know, any of those things. Fine. Just take all that from experiment. But if you want to imagine that there is an underlying theory that predicts the weak scale, that predicts symmetry breaking, now you have to put up or shut up. Okay? In other words, the hierarchy problem within the standard model might be philosophy. Okay? You could just say, I'm going to take it from experiment. But it ceases to be philosophy the second you try to find an underlying theory that allows you to calculate the Higgs mass or calculate the cosmological constant. Okay? In any such theory, and now, but now you've got to go find them. Now it's not some abstract exercise of talking about philosophy. Okay? Uh, now you have to go find a theory. So let's take, start with the cosmological constant. Okay? What is an example of a theory that lets you calculate the cosmological constant? A supersymmetric theory. Just as a toy model. Forget about the real world for a second. Okay? As a toy model, supersymmetry lets you calculate the cosmological constant because if a supersymmetric theory has an R symmetry, <laughs> Then, if the VEV of the superpotential is zero, so no R symmetry is broken, then flat space is a good solution. So now, if you have a theory that has that R symmetry and you spontaneously break supersymmetry, you can calculate 
what is the what is the value of the cosmological constant you get in that supersymmetry breaking vacuum? You can just compute it, right? There's no ifs, ands, or buts. You just compute it. Now, the reason why people take this estimate seriously is that in every such example that we found, and in this case, supersymmetry is the only such example that, that, that we know, the size of the vacuum energy that you get is exactly what you would expect from this naive estimate. It's of order of the supersymmetry breaking scale to the fourth. And it's a positive number, you just compute it. Right? In that world, you're screwed. There's nothing you can do. Right? That's, just, that's just the answer. Right? Now, you can take such a theory and add by hand uh, 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 some w naught, some piece of the superpotential that lets you uh, get an uh, ADS minimum, and then you can see that you just have to choose the value of that w naught very, very sensitively against the value of the supersymmetry breaking to get uh, sufficiently flat space. So now you can compute. Now you can compute, and then the uh, the attuning is visible in the in the face. Exactly the same thing true is true here. In the case of the Higgs, we have rather more examples, although not infinitely many. In the 30 years that people have, you know, 30 years that people have been thinking about these problems, we've found zero solutions, natural solutions to the cosmological constant problem, and roughly two or three natural solutions to the hierarchy problem. Okay? This is, by the way, why there is, it's justified to have a reasonable amount uh, of focus on these questions, because unlike many of the other mysteries of physics beyond the standard model, where you can roll out of bed every morning and write down a new model of flavor, Okay? You cannot roll out of bed in the morning and write down a new solution to the hierarchy problem. They're, they're, they're harder to do. Okay? Um, and typically, when problems fight back, it's, uh, it's a good indication that it's a good problem to spend some time focusing on. So in all known examples, when the Higgs is pseudo Goldstone boson, when uh, it's a supersymmetric theory, in all the cases where the Higgs mass becomes calculable, you see exactly the tuning that you need if you want to decouple where the rest of the new particles are from the Higgs. And that becomes not a matter of philosophy, but something you see in your face when you actually do the calculation. Okay? By the way, uh, just a little bit of history. Uh, there's this famous little hierarchy problem in supersymmetric theory. So the fact that there's a little bit of tuning already, 1%, given that we haven't seen superpartners yet, 1%, whatever it is. Um, that little hierarchy problem was noticed by people in the late 90s, mid to late 90s, who are doing explicit calculations <laughs> in theory where you could calculate the Higgs mass. Uh, many people ran into it. I ran into it as a grad student. And I, and I ran into it because I was trying to get the right answer. And I kept not being able to do it until I, you know, I kept adjusting something to the second decimal place. And I went to my advisor. And I said, this is kind of really weird. You know, I, I keep going, oh, it's fine tuning. <laughs> That's a, so you see it very explicitly okay? when you have a theory where you can actually calculate. You see the fine tuning that you actually uh, have to do. OK, so now this, of course, uh, perhaps there are completely different theories where we know how to calculate uh, the Higgs mass, where the conclusion is different. Maybe there's a theory where you get a big factor of 1 over 10 million popping out in front of these uh, estimates, and you can calculate that 10 million from the underlying theory. Great. If there is such a theory, knock yourself out. Find it. But it's not about sitting around and gazing at your navel whether this was or wasn't a good principle. It's about doing something concrete and finding a theory where you can actually calculate the Higgs mass. Okay? So victory uh, along the lines of a naturalness would have either been to find new particles right around the hundreds of GeV scale, which, while we haven't found it yet, it's not, it's not quite the end. It's the 11th hour. That's something that could be the very near-term future of the uh, LHC, if we're lucky, even though it is the 11th hour for it. But if that ends up being wrong, there are perhaps, uh, there are, there are perhaps things that, that, that we're missing uh, that we can find in a theory where we, uh, that there might actually be a theory where we can calculate the Higgs mass and we can understand um, uh, how to do the calculation and get a number uh, that is uh, uh, much smaller than, than the relevant scale k max, even without invoking multiverses, anthropics, cosmological dynamics, other things. We'll come back to some of those things later. But I just want to say that. Uh, that, uh, that it's a good idea to, to, to look for concrete theories where you can calculate the Higgs mass, because those are uh, cases where uh, you know that you're doing something and where uh, some good surprise might actually happen. OK, but before we, before we uh, move on, um, uh, I want to talk about the hierarchy problem again from another point of view that emphasizes the very, very special role of the Higgs and why it matters so much that the Higgs has spin zero. Now, here, 
it matters that the Higgs has spin zero because we are imagining giving the Higgs a VEB. <laughs> okay, so, and the only way that we can do that is if we imagine that we have, uh, that we have a particle that doesn't carry any Lorentz indices, so that it makes sense to give it a VEB without breaking Lorentz invariance. Um, but, uh, but I want to talk a little bit uh, about why it's so strange and so interesting that uh, we have an elementary particle of spin zero, because um, that's going to be one of the biggest motivations for, uh, for, for, for uh, collider experiments after the LHC to measure the heck out of the Higgs. Uh, but the first thing to do is just, again, emphasize how, how strange and odd it is that the Higgs has uh, uh, spin zero. So you've all heard this from many points of view. From a Lagrangian point of view, you can write down operators, h dagger h. Uh, it's a relevant operator from, but I want to, but I want to uh, boil it down to its purest possible, um, to the deepest reason uh, why there's something new about spin zero particles. All right, so let's come back and uh, so to do that, let's let's ask a question before talking about the Higgs. Let's talk about a particle like the photon. Okay, so you can have a general question: Why is it, you know, if there's a fundamental length scale near the Planck scale, Planck energy, whatever, why do we have any light particles compared to the Planck scale? Why do we have massless particles? In some approximation, all the particles are massless. Why do we have massless particles? So why is the photon massless? Okay, why is the photon massless? So uh, how many people want to say? Uh, how many people say that the photon is massless because of gauge invariance? It's not a trick question. <laughs> Aha, it is a trick question. <laughs> uh, okay, um, so it has, it has actually, uh, it's sort of backwards. It, it's not, it doesn't have anything to do with the uh, gauge invariance. Um, it rather, gauge invariance, uh, uh, we have gauge invariance because the photon is massless. Gauge invariance is not a fact about nature. Gauge invariance is a human construct to help us study the dynamics of massless particles using Lagrangians. Okay? Uh, it has nothing to do with nature. Uh, it has everything to do with human beings and our very local way of thinking. We like to write down local Lagrangians, field theories, and so on, uh, because we have a massless particle. Now, the real reason why the photon is massless is that there's a discrete difference between the number of degrees of freedom of a massless and a massive spin one particle. Photons are massless because two is not equal to three, okay? <laughs> Okay, because if you imagine in some approximation you had a massless spin one particle, uh, let's say free, that would be okay, right? Now imagine you turn on some little interactions. So we have all these virtual fluctuations and all these complicated diagrams. Oh, we don't have that, gosh, <laughs> right? But <laughs> uh, all sorts of crap, right? Um, none of those things can make it massive because a massive spin one particle has one more degree of freedom than a massless one. There's no degree, extra degrees of freedom there. You can't, like, all of a sudden go from two to three. It's like being a little bit pregnant, which is not possible, <laughs> okay? Okay, so, um, so this is why. Um, uh, massless particles with spin have a discontinuous difference between, uh, between massive and massless degrees of freedom with any spin, okay? Also true for spin a half. For spin a half, we have left and right... <laughs> Uh, and it's true that uh, we could we could have just left, or you could have a left and a right, but there's no reason why the interactions of the left and the right are, are treated symmetrically. So if you have a chiral theory, they're not treated symmetrically, whereas if they're massive, there would be two degrees of freedom that are treated symmetrically. Okay, So that's the degrees of freedom way of saying that a chiral symmetry protects a mass, uh, protects a mass of a fermion. Um, but, uh, but more invariantly, it's a statement about degrees of freedom. Right? There's two different degrees of freedom there, and, and, uh, and you can't, just with little interactions, you can't, uh, you can't take two degrees of freedom that are treated asymmetrically and turn them into two that are treated symmetrically. Okay, okay so, so that's, that's the reason why the photon is uh, massless, and, and gauge invariance is just our uh, human way of uh, dealing with, uh, uh, in a local way, with theories of, of uh, massless spin one particles. Uh, general covariance or diffeomorphism invariances are a human way of dealing with theories with massless spin two particles and so on. Okay, now, what about the Higgs? Well, the Higgs, the problem is, there's no difference in degrees of freedom between a massless and a massive spin zero particle. One equals one, okay? So there's absolutely no reason. There's no invariant distinction between a massless spin zero particle and a massive spin zero particle. 
Now, if you're suspicious of these arguments, there is, uh, and you, if you're suspicious of the this whole logic behind the uh, fine tuning argument, there's a setup that's not the setup of the relativistic physics of our of our vacuum, but very close by discipline in uh, condensed matter physics. In fact, this is where many of these arguments came from historically, uh, where we can see these arguments perfectly in action. Okay? Our condensed matter friends, they don't have relativistic systems, but they have, they can engineer in their labs all kinds of exciting, interesting uh, systems that are governed at long distances by some effective quantum field theories. So that's a big part of the joy of their business, is they can engineer in the lab all kinds of awesome quantum field theories, and they can study them and have infin infinite fun with them. What do we have? We have that it's relativistic. We have h-bar and c. You know, having relativity in quantum mechanics is, is a big deal. It's a big perturbation. Um, uh, but especially in the more Wilsonian way of thinking about things, you tend to think about the relativity part as some funny add-on. Okay? <laughs> Um, and, you know, broadly speaking, it's the same. They're local theories, they're quantum field theories, and so on. Now, our condensed matter friends can engineer systems that have emergent chiral fermions. They can engineer a system that have emergent gauge fields. Okay? And all the ingredients in the standard model they can make. Now, it doesn't mean that a random hunk of wood is going to have an emergent chiral fermion. You have to have the right kind of system. You have the right system. But once you get it, the presence of the Carl fermion is totally robust. You can change parameters around. You can mess things around. You always have it. Okay? Similarly for the emergent gauge field. Why is it that those things are robust once they're there? It's this argument. Okay? It's because the number of degrees of, once you get it, once you, once in, in any approximation, you get these, uh, uh, you get the, uh, uh, the helicities. Then, uh, then, then you're always going to have them, okay? And you can't change the number of degrees of freedom discontinuously. Hold on, uh, I'm going to uh, just if, if I don't answer your question in five minutes, then ask it again, <laughs> even though I don't know what it is, but I suspect I know what it is. Uh, okay. Um, what about the Higgs? They've never seen anything like the Higgs. Okay. All the rest of the standard models, roughly speaking, a dime a dozen in condensed matter. I mean, qualitatively, not the Higgs. <laughs> The Higgs is strange. It's strange, and in fact, uh, of course, there's this famously, uh, the closest analog is, is fine tuning to go close to a second order phase transition in Landau Ginzburg theory. Um, actually, a few years ago, people uh, found a closer analog of a zero temperature phase transition where you have some material which, under pressure, you could get to break an SO3 global symmetry down to SO2. Okay, so now without gauging or anything, just the Goldstone model of SO3 to SO2. And with a lot of work, they could see that, yes, indeed, they could make a Higgs like five times lighter than the cutoff, okay? <laughs> by by fine-tuning, of course, by, by finally adjusting the pressures. Forget 10 to the 32, right? You know, just uh, um, so perfectly, perfectly in accordance with the basic uh, logic associated with uh, the hierarchy problem and the fine-tuning puzzles. Okay. Now, what about uh, um, there are some scalars that are light, right? You know that the Goldstone bosons can be light, phonons or Goldstone bosons, you know, pions, um, uh, things that are free in the infrared um, can also be light. Now, that way of talking about it, we, we say it's a Goldstone boson. It has a shift symmetry, right? It has a shift symmetry. Um, how do I phrase that in this language of uh, degrees of freedom? Well, uh, it's not simply a matter of degrees of freedom because one equals one, but um, I suspect Cliff will get to this in more detail in his lectures, but uh, I'll just mention it. What's special about Goldstone bosons uh, are that in this language, of if we imagine that we have some amplitudes involving Goldstones and, and other particles, uh, the dotted lines are are, uh, are are gold stones. What's special is that if if you have the amplitude for um, for a whole bunch of particles, including a, a gold stone with momentum p1, then this amplitude goes to zero as p1 goes to zero. Okay. So let's say you have a theory that in some approximation, uh, the amplitude you have a massless particle, and the amplitude uh, to emit it goes to zero as the momentum goes to zero. Okay, so this is the sharp sense in which it's free in the infrared. OK? 
Okay, so the, the amplitude goes to zero as the momentum goes to zero. Uh, if you have any such theory, then to all orders of perturbation theory, this will continue to be true. And the reason it will continue to be true is that if you do, if you do any cut on any loop diagram, get any imaginary part of anything that you're going to uh, induce, it all involves sewing together amplitudes with the goldstones, and they will all vanish and limit as the momentum go to zero. Okay, so that's the that's the physical on shell way of saying what's special about goldstones. There are theories where the amplitude goes to zero. How, from this point of view, do we talk about theories where the uh, symmetry is a little broken? So, if we take the models where the Higgs is, is a pseudo goldstone boson, for example, well, what's going on is that in those theories the symmetry is broken. So the amplitude doesn't vanish as the momentum goes to zero. You can't even take the momentum to zero because the particle is massive. But it's what, it's what you'd expect. If the particle is a mass m, then in the limit, you, 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 you can imagine some amplitude where you have all the other particles. Uh, you have this particle that has a momentum p. And in the limit where all the other, let's call this momentum q, in the limit where all the other momenta are roughly capital P, then as you take Q to be much, much larger than M, okay, but much smaller than all, all the P's, this amplitude goes like roughly something like M squared over P, P dot Q, something like that. Okay? So that if you, if you make all the momenta really big compared to the scale M, and then you, you take one of the uh, Higgs is a goldstone, pseudo goldstone bosons, and you take its momentum to be soft, then you'll find that, oh, look, it's, it's heading to, towards being small. Of course, when you get to zero momentum, things change, and, uh, um, and uh, this, this, this is no longer true, but this is the sense in which asymptotically it's true at very, very high energies. Okay? So when, the, when all of these scales, the p dot q's and the p squared and so on, are much bigger than m squared. This is to be contrasted with a real Higgs. So let's say we do the simplest case. Let's say just two to two scattering. Two, you know, the, uh, the two to two scattering of the Higgs. What does the two to two scattering of the Higgs look like at very high energies in the standard model? What do you think it goes like? Roughly a constant, right? There's a quartic coupling, so the, it's like a coupling lambda. Or maybe there's the gauge interaction, so there's something that looks like g squared s over t. But if you're at high energies, fixed angles, the all the, uh, all the couplings are dimensionless, so the amplitude goes like, the amplitude goes like uh, constant. Okay? That's the physical difference between saying that the Higgs is an elementary Higgs all the way up to very high energies versus saying that it's a pseudo, is that in a theory where it's a pseudo, you would find, as you go to energies much above the weak scale, that the Higgs-Higgs amplitude has this funny extra softness. Okay? All right? Okay. Okay, so... Um, so that's the uh, quick introduction to the tuning problems, um, both in a way that emphasizes the connection to the cosmological constant, uh, as well as uh, what emphasizes the connection with, uh, uh, with the number of degrees of freedom. By the way, uh, what is the analog of the degrees of freedom argument for the cosmological constant? Yes. Okay. <laughs> that can 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 anyone say what? So so here we say the reason we have a fine tuning problem for the Higgs is that one equals one, right? Nothing changes when you go from negative mass squared positive mass squared zero. Number of degrees of freedom is constant. What is the analog of that argument for the cosmological constant? Does that does anyone know? I know the volume of the universe certainly changes. For example, you can go from, like, you know, depending on how you count, it, 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 it's always infinity, for example. So the volume isn't, isn't uh, well, it, it's, it's perhaps slightly more subtle. Uh, if, we talk about, if we talk about the symmetries that we have in empty space, what are the symmetries we have in empty space when you have negative cosmological constant? You have anti de Sitter space, right? So you can ask, what is the symmetry group of anti de Sitter space? What is the symmetry group of flat space? What is the symmetry group of de Sitter space? And the total number of generators is conserved. It's exactly the same. Okay, you're not changing it at all as you change the value 
of the uh, cosmological constant. Okay? The symmetries of anti de Sitter space, well, anyway, do the, do the exercise. Right? It's a very nice exercise to just count all the symmetries there are. You have to count the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the generators of, uh, uh, you, if, if you think about uh, uh, of ADS as having an uh, SOD minus one comma two symmetry, you count all of those generators, you compare it to the number of generators of the, of the Poincaré group, and you compare it to the number of generators of the De Sitter group, and of course, the number of generators is exactly the same. So there's no invariant distinction from that point of view. Uh, uh, zero, zero is not any kind of symmetry enhanced point. Okay, so that's the, that, that's the analog. Well, how do you use this argument for Berlin? Sorry? How do you use the argument if you Oh, it's, it's, it's exactly the same. If you, if you imagine, uh, if you have a massive fermion and you go to very high energies and it's a chiral theory, you'll find that the chirality violating processes are suppressed by powers of M. Okay, you know that very well. That's why you put these chirality flips when you use vial fermions on all those, uh, on all the uh, diagrams. Okay, any other questions? Uh, yeah. Yes. You mentioned that we have uh, now gauge symmetry with the spot and the mass. Yes. But they, in the conversion of the Kandel model, we did the opposite. We include mass terms because we have gauge symmetry being in the principle. Yes, it's backwards. But, but this is, uh, but, um, oh, I, I should have said this right at the beginning. Um, uh, um, uh, I'd be very happy to talk about any aspect of any part of physics. Um, uh, things that I can't cover in the uh, lectures. Uh, I'm staying in the dorms with all the rest of you. Uh, in, uh, in, in many previous uh, iterations of TASI, we've had many enjoyable conversations till 3, 4 a.m. So if you, wanna, if you want answers to questions like that, find me at midnight. <laughs> and then, um, uh, hiking is also okay, but I'm only here till uh, Wednesday afternoon. Midnight will be safer then. <laughs> okay. All right. So, um, yeah, I, we, we, yeah. So th that's a uh, that's a whole other bit of indoctrination about uh, gauge redundancies. It's not best done in a lecture. Okay. So um, now, before reviewing again some of the standard arguments uh, about uh, tuning. Uh, let me just make one comment. Um, it's a purely numerological observation, but many people have made it over the years. Uh, so we have the CC, uh, two, 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 two comments. We have both a CC and a hierarchy problem. The elephant in the room for ages was the CC problem when people gave talks on the hierarchy problem. You know, I remember when I was a student, people would come t give talks about the hierarchy problem, and you weren't allowed to put up your hand and say, is there a much bigger cosmological constant problem? <laughs> no, <laughs> you know, yes, there is, but, but that's solved by something else. It has nothing to do with the hierarchy problem. Um, by the way, it might still be true. It might still end up being true. Uh, not all problems have to be related to each other. Not all problems have to be solved uh, simultaneously. And this is another topic for a midnight discussion, but, uh, uh, but we can really go through the, the many examples in the last hundred years where analogs of the hierarchy problem came up, which were solved in exactly the way that people were hoping it would be solved with new physics at the LHC, and where you could bitch and whine about the cosmological constant, and you would have been wrong to do so. <laughs> okay? So uh, nonetheless, uh, here they seem a little bit more closely tied to each other, because one is a subleading version of the other. Um, now, we can ask, is naturalness correct for the cosmological constant problem? Makes a very dramatic prediction. If we use exactly the same logic uh, that we use with naturalness and the Higgs, we say we should put the cutoff at a scale where the size of the uh, vacuum energy is not too big. What does the size of the vacuum energy have to be? Was 10 to the minus 3 EV to the fourth. So what should the scale be? We should have a cutoff at around 10 to the minus 3 EV. Okay, so what is 10 to the minus 3 EV is a length scale. What is 1 over 10 to the minus 3 EV? It's around a millimeter. Okay, so a few hundred microns. So we just did the experiment. It's wrong. Okay, there's no new physics at a millimeter. Yeah, we don't need the large millimeter collider. Okay, uh, in fact, you could imagine that your creatures that were built out of atoms that were kilometers big. Okay, imagine in some dark sector, there are some creatures uh, made out of atoms that are kilometers big. They're very smart. They uh, realize there's a cosmology. Everything is great. They understand particle physics, quantum field theory. Uh, 
and they understand there's a terrible cosmological constant problem. Okay? So they think and they think and they think. They say, I know. Supersymmetry solves the cosmological constant problem. It's spectacular. We just have to go to the millimeter scale and we'll see super partners there. Okay? And they beg their governments, multinational governments, for <laughs> huge funds to build the large millimeter collider. <laughs> okay? And they go and it's not there. Right? Supersymmetry could have easily solved the cosmological constant problem if it was at the millimeter scale. Okay? And it did not. Now, in, uh, in, in fairness to my great friend Raman Sandram, I should say that there is a very lawyerly uh, uh, thing that you could say, which is that maybe this cutoff is only on gravity. <laughs> okay, so you'd have to have a cutoff at the millimeter scale, but it's only for gravity. And that things that get more off shell than a millimeter, you know, stop gravitating somehow, and there's a cutoff on things that couple to a gravity. Now, never mind the fact that all sorts of things are off-shell by vastly more than a millimeter. Every atom in my body, the electrons moving around are off-shell by more than a millimeter. Every gluon and every proton is off-shell by more than a millimeter. Okay, you know, there's a very lawyerly effective theory you can construct that you can claim is not inconsistent with all the things that we know. Okay, maybe. But you make a qualitative prediction that uh, gravity should shut off if you measure it in submillimeter. Uh, experiments. And people are really, uh, Adelberger's group at all at the University of Washington are really in the territory where they're probing exactly this. Okay, so I think this is now the best motivation for pushing the limits on measuring gravity on small scales. If you get to less than 100 microns, 80 microns, there's no hint of gravity shutting off, then I think uh, this idea, which doesn't really have any theoretical foundations at all to speak of, will also uh, die a uh, more or less dignified experimental death. Okay? So I think we can, we can more or less say that, that, that naturalness has just failed, just abjectly failed, uh, for the cosmological constant. Okay? So will it or won't it fail for the hierarchy problem? Well, we're going to find out. Uh, as I said, we're in, the, we're in the 11th hour for it. Uh, as I'm sure was explained in, uh, in some detail uh, in your other lectures, you know, if you, if you just cut off the top loop uh, contribution of the Higgs mass and ask where the particles should be, it should be around 400 GeV in order for the correction to the Higgs mass to be comparable to the Higgs mass. And uh, that means that if we fail to see stops at the LHC, we're not talking about a part in a thousand tuning. We're talking about a part in you know, somewhere between, you know, without being, again, too lawyerly, maybe between 10% and a percent level, level tuning that's absolutely forced on us. And that's not good, but it's certainly not a part in 10 to the 32. And we can have endless discussions about other places in physics where we've seen comparable levels of tuning. Needless to say, again, another thing for a midnight discussion, a lot of these midnight discussions now, um, that, uh, that in other cases in the history of physics where naturalness has worked, no one had to make excuses. Okay? It just worked whammo. Worked big time. No one had to talk about whether 10% was good or bad, or you know, uh, these completely pointless, idiotic discussions. Uh, no one had to have them. Okay? Uh, we are being forced into having them now. All right. Um, another little comment is uh, the numerological one uh, that that I wanted to make, which is that is there any hint of a connection between these problems? Well, there's just a tiny bit of numerology that uh, many of you are probably familiar with which is that the scale of the cosmological constant, lambda to the quarter, so this is around 10 to the minus 3 eV, is roughly the weak scale squared over m Planck. Okay. That didn't quite have to be the case. And that uh, certainly this little bit of numerology uh, could suggest that there is something that we don't understand uh, about both problems. And, that, um, and if we have a better understanding of one, uh, it might lead to an understanding of the other. And the problems aren't factorized the way almost all the thinking about them uh, has, has been. I'll come back to this in a little bit uh, at the end. It's actually related. Uh, by the way, as you saw in, uh, in the uh, last lecture, uh, this scale, v squared over m Planck, or v squared over some high scale, is also naturally the scale of the, of the neutrino masses. <laughs> Okay? And the neutrino masses are not far from 10 to the minus 3 eV. They're between, you know, around a 30th of an eV, okay? Somewhere around uh, that scale. So this is also, again, very, very loosely, this is also around the mass scale of the neutrinos. 
And is there anything to these coincidences? Let's just something to keep in the back of your mind. Okay. So any questions about this? What's yes. the time scale for those probing gravity at a, at a 100 millimeter scale? Like well, they're, they're, the, the, the time scales are, are, time scales are long. You're not, you're, you're um, uh, I mean, you're, uh, d there, there's various kinds of, of, uh, of experiments, but, but, but you typically have, have a torsion balance. And um, yeah, so the, 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 the time scales are much, 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 much longer than the light crossing time of, of no, no, order. Sorry, I yeah, meant right. more uh, right. the time scale that we'll, we'll get an answer to these questions. So oh, that time scale. Yes, yes. yes. Oh, no, they're, 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 they're doing it now. I mean, I think that uh, I don't actually, I haven't kept up with what the very, very latest is. But they were, I mean, a, f a number of, a few years ago, they were right in the territory where, you know, Raman would want uh, a signal, okay? So I think uh, this is going to be the next gen I mean, this generation, not next generation. That, that I think that, that's, that's when we'll have a pretty, pretty complete answer uh, to this question. Okay, so, all right, now, so, again, um, so one possibility, you've, you've heard from a number of lectures, I'm sure, um, we, we uh, naturalness, good old-fashioned naturalness, may still be vindicated, or we might get, you know, we might still see a bunch of uh, natural physics. It might end up being looking tuned to a part in 30. No one will give a rat's ass. Okay, uh, we'll have way too much fun figuring out what the uh, physics is. Maybe in 30 years, people will come back and wonder why it looked a little tuned, but it won't be. It won't be a, a big deal. Okay. On the other hand, um, it could be there's something more. Oh, and sorry, and I, I should have said, um, in along the lines of uh, natural theories, um, uh, the reason why uh, the reason why uh, people like supersymmetric theories uh, more than any of the others um, was uh, was not so much sociology. In fact, the supersymmetric theories were not very popular for a long time. Um, it's because supersymmetric theories have one thing going for them. Okay, uh, of course, there's a beautiful symmetry, blah blah, um, but there's the, there's this hint. There are two hints. Uh, one is there really for any natural solution of the hierarchy problem. You may well have uh, extra particles that are uh, that are, for example, fermions that don't carry baryon or lepton number. If baryon and lepton number are good symmetries at the weak scale, which they had better be, otherwise we would have, uh, uh, otherwise we would have known by now, then it's possible that you have exactly stable particles uh, that are stable as a consequence of the symmetries of baryon number, lepton number, and fermion number. Um, so, for instance, neutral fermions that don't carry baryon or lepton number, like LSPs. Okay, so and they can be perfect dark matter candidates. So that you all know. Um, that's generically true for lots of theories of physics beyond the standard model, not just supersymmetry. So that's a general plus for the idea that we should have new particles at the weak scale. But the one thing that supersymmetric theories have that no other theories have is this beautiful, spectacular picture of precision gauge coupling unification. Okay? And that did not have to happen. And when people first made the prediction, it was off from the central values compared to just the standard model all the way up to the gut scale. And it was only 10 years later when the measurements were done much better and the error bar shrunk, that, that the supersymmetric picture emerged as the one that was valid at the uh, percent level. Okay, so, um, so that's still sitting there. Maybe that's a complete red herring. Okay, maybe it's a total accident. Um, it's possible that it's a total accident. Uh, but, it's, uh, but there was a reason why people were excited. The sort of peak of this excitement is uh, 1991, 1992, uh, that you have gauge coupling unification, there's dark matter, there's all. And there's just a hint of tiny hint of disquiet that you should have seen superpartners at LEP. The sleptons could have been at 60 GeV or 40 GeV. You could have seen superpartners at Petra. You guys don't even know what Petra was, okay? Um, but then it's just uh, as time went on, you know, uh, it got logarithmically worse, uh, and um, and uh, we're now. In, uh, but but I want to emphasize it's not a situation uh, with the. Many supersymmetry enthusiasts completely 100% convinced that the LHC would be roiling with superpartners, and then after run one, it's like, oh my god, it was wrong. <laughs> there are some fraction of people who have been predicting supersymmetry will be discovered six months in the future for 20 years. <laughs> okay, uh, but people who have, you know, uh, uh, people who have deeply thought about uh, TeV scale physics 
have been concerned already from the late 1990s. So there's, uh, so so this is not a big surprise. Um, and 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 not seeing new particles, not just supersymmetry, but any natural physics, uh, at the end of run one um, uh, from the LHC is more or less compatible with what we knew indirectly already uh, from beforehand. Not seeing them at run two will be qualitatively different. Will push us into territory that we're not forced into from the absence of seeing things in in run one. But again, I want to emphasize that that that, that picture may still end up being may may well still end up being correct. On the other hand, it could be that something more structural and deep is wrong, and that the story in 50 years will be, oh my god, how could those people have ignored this elephant in the room? How could they possibly have ignored that thing? The morons, right? They, uh, it was sitting there all along, and it was telling them something else. Okay? Um, and, uh, and, okay. So what, 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 what could it be? Well, uh, right now, the only picture that we have uh, the only scientific picture we have uh, that can explain the smallness of the cosmological constant um, is this idea that uh, not modifying physics at very short distances, like we've been used to with the hierarchy problem, but modifying what we think of, of uh, space-time at very, very long distances, and this picture of, uh, of an enormous number of different vacua, um, which are somehow cosmologically populated. This is not going to be a lecture on the landscape or on eternal inflation or measure problems or all the rest of it. Um, all I want to say is that there's the one success uh, in this business is totally phenomenological and is Weinberg's <laughs> minus all the, all the deep confusions about uh, measures and eternal inflation and all the rest of it, just the basic obvious fact that if you take the relevant parameter, the biggest, most relevant parameter in the standard model, the cosmological constant, you imagine what the universe would look like if you just made that parameter bigger, very quickly the universe is drastically different. <laughs> Okay, that's Weinberg's argument. If you imagine, we have the two relevant parameters. Here's the cosmological constant. Here's the Higgs mass. What happens if we make, here's 10 to the minus 3 EV to the fourth. What happens if we make it 10 to the minus 2 EV to the fourth? Okay, then out here, the universe is empty. Okay, that's Weinberg's argument. Okay. That if you imagine there are some regions where the uh, cosmological constant takes on different values, in the region where the cosmological constant is even 30 times bigger. Here I've made it 10,000 times bigger, because it's raised to the fourth. <laughs> okay, but just make it 30 times bigger. In those regions, the acceleration of the universe is accelerating things so rapidly that you rip apart structure before it has a chance to coalesce gravitationally. Okay? So you might imagine, even if we don't understand everything deeply, from some kind of God's eye perspective, looking out at this whole vast, big scale universe, that it's empty, 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 empty. Whoops, it's not empty. Right here in this teeny tiny place, it's not empty. And it's just a feature of the places that it's not empty that the cosmological constant is minuscule. Okay? Now, if the underlying mechanism exists and it makes sense, there is nothing wrong with this argument. We use this kind of argument all the time to explain features of our own universe. After all, you can do a little estimate to see that the volume that we occupy in our universe, our volume, is 10 to the minus 60, our Hubble volume. Why isn't this 10 to the minus 60 a pressing problem of theoretical physics? Okay, well, because where else are we gonna be? We're gonna be, we're on a little rock. We're not in the middle of interstellar dust because we can't be in the middle of interstellar dust. It doesn't bother us, okay? Now, for this to be the explanation, though, if the minimum size of the vacuum energy that you need is like 10 to the minus 2 EV to the fourth, say, that's what ended up being. Let's say the cosmological constant ended up being 10 to the minus 30 EV to the fourth. Then that's not the explanation. <laughs> it's part of the explanation, but, but it's probably not the explanation because it's vastly smaller even than it needs to be. Right? The striking part of Weinberg's argument is that the cosmological constant is right near this dangerous place where if we make it a little bigger, the universe is empty. But that's just a fact. That's just a fact. How we interpret it, what it means deeply, this is just a striking fact. Right? If we, uh, if we take that one relevant operator, we make it a little more natural, a little bigger, the universe is empty. What happens if we take the other relevant parameter of the standard model and we make that bigger, the Higgs mass? Well, if you make that a little bigger, now, uh, so let's say you make the Higgs mass squared more negative, okay? more natural, more negative. 
What happens there? Well, if the Higgs vav just gets three times bigger than what it is in our universe, then the down quark gets even heavier than the up quark. The neutron gets even heavier than the proton. And now there's a funny fact about nuclear physics, that if you've ever tried to understand nuclear physics, it's very confusing. And it's confusing because nuclear physics is fine-tuned. Okay? Like, you know that you can have a neutron and a proton, and a neutron and a proton are bound, but two neutrons are not bound. There's no NN bound state. Right? So why do all these accidents happen? These accidents happen because the neutron-proton mass splitting, the reason we have complicated nuclei, is because the neutron-proton mass splitting is comparable to nuclear binding energies. Okay? But the scales are very different parametrically. The neutron-proton mass splitting comes from electroweak symmetry breaking. It comes from alpha. The overall scales of nuclear physics are just 100 MeV. Right? They're not parametrically tied to each other at all. The fact that we have interesting nuclei is an accident. It's an accident about where the weak scale is. And it turns out if you just make the Higgs vev three times bigger, then the neutron gets so much heavier than the proton, there's no nuclei anymore. You just have hydrogen. Okay. But we can just move right? Uh, well, so I, I'm just saying, if we, uh, all I'm doing here is taking the standard model and moving the two relevant operators and nothing else. Okay? Just saying we make mh squared more negative, we lose atoms. That happens when the Higgs vev is three times bigger. When it gets bigger enough still, in fact, the lightest baryon is a delta plus plus. Uh, and the universe is all helium, <laughs> effectively, because a delta plus plus just looks like, uh, has charge two. So it looks just, just, just like helium. So now, is this good, bad? Is it good, bad that the universe is empty for the existence of observers and the infamous A word? Okay? Is it good, bad that, uh, that, that we uh, have only, uh, uh, have, uh, have only uh, hydrogen or not? Um, we don't need to have that, uh, we don't need to have that discussion, but it's an interesting fact. It is just an interesting fact that, that the observed values of these two relevant operators are close to cliffs. They're close to cliffs where the physics changes dramatically as you cross to the other side. So um, this makes it possible to entertain other explanations. Again, along the lines of the only place where observers could exist are places, if you imagine being able to scan. Now, we do have to say the A word. We do have to say the word anthropic, although it doesn't have much to do with people. It has to do with whether the universe is empty or whether it has anything other than hydrogen in it. Um, uh, so, so qualitative differences. Um, and uh, uh, so this is at least a picture, a picture uh, for an alternate explanation for these uh, fine-tuning problems. Now, um, this picture gets an enormous amount of uh, criticism. And I think uh, a lot of the, I, I count myself as uh, one of the people who's more sympathetic towards these ideas, probably, than the average physicist, although not as evangelical about them as the others. Um, because I just think it's concrete. You know, I, I'm, I think I, I'm always a fan. I think we should always be a fan of anything which is concrete. You can do a calculation, something happens, rather than just blah, blah. Okay? So here, someone's got to do some work. Weinberg had to do some work to see that, yeah, it's, uh, it's a factor of 30. Some of Donahue had to do some work to see what, what happens here. And it's just, it's just, it's just interesting facts. Now, um, uh, this makes it, so this is, this, is, this, is a, this, is, this is a picture. Um, what I wanted to say is that it's criticized tremendously. Uh, and I think some of the criticism and people talking about it are going um, at cross purposes to each other. Because this is not yet a theory. You know, the standard model is a theory. Um, uh, even loosely, uh, uh, even being more loose about the word uh, theory. Uh, string theory is a the theory. It's at least, there's a framework where you can do any calculation in principle. You know how to start, you know how to set things up, at least in some approximations. This picture of the multiverse and the landscape is not a theory, it's a cartoon. Okay? It's not a, it, it doesn't even rise to the level of being called a theory yet. It's a sketch. It's a program. It's a hope. Okay? Um, why do people talk about it? Because it's the only concrete program available uh, that anyone has thought of to make uh, progress, at least on the uh, cosmological constant problem. But one thing that it does, and one thing that you can do when, when you just have a cartoon, and this is just what I want to end with, um, partially because uh, uh, I also want to say what my own prejudice is for what I think is going on at the, given all the information we have, and I wouldn't uh, 
you know, I wouldn't bet my life on this, but, but I think given all the information I have, uh, we have, it's, it's, my own, uh, it, it's my own prejudice, my own picture for what's going on at, uh, at the weak scale. Um, I'll be happy to drop it instantaneously if we have uh, solid evidence for uh, different kinds of physics and what I'm about to say. Um, but I, I think that there's something compelling about this picture for the cosmological constant. But if you imagine taking it all the way, you might say, look, um, what about two things? First, why did we have, if this is how the hierarchy problem is solved, why did it look like things were going so well in the 80s and the early 90s? Why did it look like supersymmetry was right? Why did it look like we had gauge coupling innovation, dark matter? You know, it's just, is nature giving us the middle finger? You know, if this is all true, it's just a standard model with this crappy anthropic reason. Uh, why did it look like all those things were right? So this seems to be a tension. This is the central tension, in my mind, of uh, physics beyond the standard model for the last 30 years. On the one hand, you have these good things, dark matter and gauge coupling unification, saying that this idea is on the right track. On the other hand, you have things pointing in the opposite direction from day one, the absence of baron and lepton number violation, the absence of flavor changing neutral currents, all the stuff that could have been there at the TEV scale uh, that could have shown up indirectly that we didn't see. Then the fact that we didn't see the particles as we went to a higher energies. How could both these two things be true at the same time? Okay? And the picture that I like the most that explains how both things could be true at the same time is the picture of split supersymmetry with the, in the minimal version where you imagine that supersymmetry is broken by some dynamics and that gauge masses are a loop factor smaller than scalars simply because scalars only have to break supersymmetry to get a mass in supersymmetric theories, but fermions also have to break an R symmetry. So it's natural for fermions to be lighter than scalars. It's natural for the gravitino and the scalars to be comparable in mass, if there's any even kind of rough picture of uh, uh, gravity mediation. And then, then gauginos are naturally loop factor lighter than the gravitinos. So you'd have a factor of 100 splitting between the gauginos and the scalars. Just in the minimal picture, you do absolutely nothing clever. Uh, you just let supersymmetry break in the dumbest possible way. And that's what you'd get. Now, this is what people found in the 80s, right away, when they broke supersymmetry. It's what they found in, uh, again, in the late 90s, when they ran into the uh, phenomenon of, of anomaly mediation. And they hated it. People hated it because it wasn't natural, right? It, it wasn't uh, 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 this factor of 100 splitting uh, meant that uh, if you wanted the bottom of the spectrum to be there for dark matter, the bottom of the spectrum would be at the hundreds of GeV or the TeV scale. And then the top of the spectrum, where the scalars were, would be way too heavy, and you'd have a part in 10,000, a part in 100,000, a part in a million, depending on the, the details, tuning. Now, in a picture without a landscape, that's insane. In a picture with a landscape, it's chump change. Okay? It's chump change compared to the one part in 10 to the 60, at least, fine tuning that you're doing for the cosmological constant anyway. Right? So being on some high naturalness high horse uh, is already not really true because, uh, because uh, you're doing a tremendous fine tuning for the cosmological constant. And now it becomes a question of details of uh, you know, precisely uh, what the possible distribution of vacuum may or may not look like. Even if we don't think, even if we don't even try to understand that in a detail, we can take inspiration from this picture that it's possible to utter the word supersymmetry and fine tuning in the same sentence. Uh, we were already uttering it in the same sentence when it came to the cosmological concept. And if you say that, and then you break supersymmetry in the simplest way, that's the sort of spectrum you'd get. Now, in that spectrum, you have the success of dark matter still. Gauge coupling unification works just as well as it does uh, in the standard supersymmetric picture because, uh, because the particles that you're making heavy are coming in complete multiplets of SU5 and they affect the beta function uh, the same way at the one loop. In fact, at two loops, famously, there's a little bit off in uh, the, the uh, standard uh, TEV scale supersymmetric running up to the gut scale. And uh, having this little bit of a threshold where the scalars are heavier than the gauginos goes in, in the right direction. Um, also, if the scalars at hundreds or thousands of uh, TeV 
Uh, you get rid of all the problems with flavor changing neutral currents. There's a good reason why we hadn't seen all those things before. Um, and uh, finally, uh, you make a prediction for the Higgs mass. And the Higgs mass should be between 120 and 135 GeV. Uh, if you imagine that it's a standard supersymmetric boundary conditions at the high scale and you run down, 125 GeV is perfectly healthy, reasonable uh, value compatible with that picture. Okay. So uh, this takes inspiration from the landscape um, that we might see something that would look very strange from a conventional perspective. It would look like a highly fine-tuned theory from a conventional perspective. But from the larger perspective, uh, where fine-tuning is happening anyway, for some reason, and the landscape gives us a picture for how it might happen, then it's possible that what, what, what we might see is evidence for a tuned uh, supersymmetric theory. And how might we see it now? The, the, the only problem with this idea is that it's not obvious whether we will see particles at the LHC. We may or we may not. It's a kind of a 50-50 proposition. I don't know how to put a measure on this parameter space. It really depends what the mass of the dark matter particle is. If the dark matter particle is a thermal Higgsino, then the Higgsino is at the bottom of the spectrum at 1 TeV. Then, you know, is the Gluino at 3 TeV or at 5 TeV? Don't know. If it's at 3 TeV, we'll see it. If it's 5 TeV, we won't. Okay? It's possible that the dark matter particle is more of a linear combination of the... Uh, see, the, the, the Gaginos have got to be light in this picture. It's possible it's more of a linear combination. It could be lighter, then, then the Gluino is more accessible. It could be the bottom of the spectrum is a Wino. So thermal we know is at 2.7 TeV, and then uh, if we ignore a little bit limits on this uh, from uh, not seeing gamma rays from the center of the galaxy at Hess, uh, then the top of the spectrum could be at 8 TeV, Gluinos, God knows. Then we're not going to see it at the LHC. Okay? So, but if we do see it, there's a, uh, there's a very clear prediction that you should see the Gluinos, you should see the Gaginos, you should not see the scalars. And if the scalars are as heavy as, uh, as, as about a 500 GeV, 1000, uh, 500 to 1000 TeV, then, and if the Gluino is near the TeV scale, then the Gluino should have a displacement before it decays. It has to decay through off-shell scalars, and that gives it a long enough lifetime that you should see you know, between 100 micron to a few centimeter uh, displacement for its decay. That's the smoking gun. Okay? That is the smoking cannon. Uh, that, that you've seen the Gaginos, but the scalars are much, much heavier. Okay? So, and that is a picture, uh, as I said, it will certainly not prove that the landscape is right, but it will give us evidence for a picture that would be uh, very strange from a conventional perspective, but could make more sense So, from, uh, from, from, from this perspective. So that's my own prejudice for what's happening uh, at the uh, uh, TEV scale. And, um, uh, I will uh, end it at that. Tomorrow we'll come back and talk about part two. Uh, but if anyone is interested uh, in uh, uh, conversations uh, tonight, we could talk about all kinds of things together. Um, for example, we could talk about um, uh, other strange links. Uh, there's a, I, I find that there's a fascinating link between neutrino masses and the cosmological constant. Um, that, uh, that might be the hint of something. It's something which has fascinated me for, for over 10 years now. I can't do anything about it, but if people are, are interested, I'm, I'm happy to, uh, to talk about that. I'm happy to talk about relaxions, uh, other cosmological approaches to the hierarchy problems, some things that some, some, some young friends and I have been working on, um, uh, other cosmological solutions to the hierarchy problem, and uh, uh, this whole panoply of ideas. But, um, uh, but I'll leave it at that for today, and we'll pick it up with the collider physics tomorrow. Thanks a lot.